The time has come for my people to go. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's what the people demand, and we're gonna keep fighting till we get that land. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's time to rise to get what we want, we got to organize. Right, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Pantsula Podcast, brought to you by the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the AAPRP, we were founded by Kwame Nkrumah in 1968. Um, so, also for those who are not uh, familiar with our objective, our objective is Pan Africanism, and we define that as a totally liberated and unified Africa under scientific socialism, as defined in the Fifth Pan African Congress. As you can see here today, I have my, uh, fellow, my com- a few of my fellow comrades here with me, uh, Jesse, Winford, and Evan. Um, so before we begin to talk about the, the topic we'll be discussing today, I'd like to dedicate this episode, uh, as we do every other episode, to two of our ancestors, this one being to Kuwaiti Balagun and Mawina Kuwaiti. Uh, so today we'll be discussing the uh, myth of Black buying power. Um, so I know, especially, I think it's a perfect time we're talking about this, especially in the climate where the, it's the anniversary of the t- uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre uh, that took place. Um, so I think it's a perfect time because I think a lot of sentiments around that is based off of Black Wall Street and um, Black capitalism. We have so many businesses. So I think it's a, it's a great time to talk about this <laughs> right now. Um, so I guess something I'll post to my comrades as a starter is you know maybe some of the things we hear centered around black buying power and what are what are the limitations to that whole uh rhetoric i would say well i think llc twitter uh black businesses we hear all the time you know we got to start a business the reason why we're in this predicament is because we don't have businesses um there's just been a lot of propaganda i think and i've just heard that there's small businesses right like we need to just support black businesses so that we can build some sort of community wealth. But of course, the history and you know, doing a quick analysis, we can see that that's not the case. I mean, black businesses still have the banks that control the affairs and everything like that. So it's not like that would be a solution, but I think more than ever now lately, especially seeing more and more people just kind of pr- promote that message that we can be liberated if we were to kind of galvanize our funds to just support ourselves. But obviously that doesn't account for the role of um, just the production who's actually taking the mineral wealth. And um, so I just think we're inundated with that over and over and over. And we look at the petty bourgeois class um, celebrities and they're pretty keen at that as well. So we're just having to constantly arm ourselves in this ideological struggle because clearly We've seen so many of our friends, family are just beaten by this message. And, you know, just being in this organization is it's work because it's like, ah, that, you know, having to catch when you hear people give you those kind of regurgitation points, uh, just knowing where to come from, having analysis, uh, race, gender, um, and all of that is important. So, Yeah, I would, I would say, too, I think you hear a lot of the uh, trillion dollar buying power um, all the time. And a great book I have. That debunks a lot of that, which is the name of our episode. It's a book by Jared Ball, The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power. Please get this book. He had it for free for a good amount of time. I'm not too sure. Yeah, it's still free. Yep. It's still free. Okay, cool. Yeah, so you can get it for free, PDF, so you don't have to uh, pay for the book if you don't have the, the means to. Um, so yeah, I think that's one thing we hear and something we've been hearing over the last 30 years and hasn't been stopped uh, getting pushed. And, uh, you know, just understanding that, you know, something that Dr. Ball talks about in this book is that uh, the initial premise of, or the notion of it came from Nixon, essentially. Well, I mean, it didn't really come from him, but he was the one who pushed it. Uh, you know, there was that whole buy black thing that came way before him, um, as well, but he kind of pushed that as a means to deter the, the sixties, uh, sixties movements like the Black Panther Party and others, snake and so forth and so on. Um, as a, as a means to derail them, uh, to unrevolutionary means. So, um, you know, even with that, that trillion dollar buying power, you know, he debunks that uh, because the main center for that, a lot of that notion is uh, C, the Selig and Nielsen reports um, that were put out. Uh, so he kind of, I think I have some quotes here from his book. 
um, in regards to like the trillion dollar buying power. He said uh, 40 million times 40,000 is 1.6 trillion. Uh, slights more than the claimed 1.6 trillion in buying power. And that kind of just goes to show that uh, what he was talking about in the book is that they weren't really clear in defining how they got to that trillion dollars. <laughs> People regurgitate it, but they don't never talk about, okay, what did that trillion, like what are the methods or means used to uh, gain, get to that trillion dollar number to say that we have disposable income that equates to a trillion dollars that we're just not spending, given, especially given the situation that you know, we're oppressed people. And it's like, on one end, people understand that we're oppressed and downtrodden. But on the other hand, they said we have this trillion dollar buying power, which really doesn't make sense um, at the same time. Um, so, yeah, I think I have some some other stuff in here, too. And he says, uh, for example, if it takes 44 percent of income to make rent in predominantly black communities and uh, all told, the black community earns roughly less than 80 billion dollars annually. How then is there so much disposable left for the purchasing goods and services? Um, so there you can just see like a, predominant, uh, a good amount of our money is going to, uh, you know, rent, food, clothes, which he covers in the book, food, clothes, which is basic necessities, um, you know, that are taking up a lot of our money. It's not that we have this disposable money that we just spend on rims that we're just frivolously yeah. splurging and all these other things. Um, and even in the Nelson report itself even says that, uh, you know, buying power is not a derivative of, of actual wealth right. uh, as well. So he, he states that in his book as well, so. Um, just wanted to put that out there, uh, you know, for those who believe in that. Um, but that's definitely a book I recommend for everyone to get. And and going along with another point is that even if even if you did have this like, magic trillion dollars of of buying power that, as you mentioned, that the law has been on necessities and just to get around and just to live, that especially since like the seventies that. With the flat, flat, flatlining of of income relative to product productivity, that a lot of that is made made, made up with debt. So, so, if you spend so if you're spending all this money using it on debt, if you have to take out debt to pay off, so pay off your rent, pay off for something, pay off for some furniture, pay off some clothing, and stuff, or especially if you're if you're fortunate enough to be able to go to college, especially since more and more colleges are not free than, and right, then tuitions right, rises and fees rising. So he's paying on debt and then, oh, 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 now you, oh, no, we want you to be, make businesses. Uh, okay. Uh, where's my wealth? Uh, uh, I got, got paid like a couple thousand on my credit card. I got, I got to do another, Take out another loan, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. Take it out another loan. Yeah. And uh, oh yeah, that's going to go well. <laughs> Right. Just don't talk to me about that. Like, like think, think, think systematically. Like, I, I, how do you? How, like, we, you just, you just think we're just gonna, we're just gonna get all this money just falling out of our hands? No, no. Come on. Yeah, and another great book, as actually I was just uh, started reading pretty recently, um, is the Myth of Black Capitalism, which is a book that uh, Dr. Jared Ball cites in his work. Um, I think was put out like in the early '90s, um, and he talks about the whole notion of like. You know, I'm still early in the book, but he gets into um, how it all started with the black elite or petty bourgeois class starting um, even in the midst of before the Civil War. So like during slavery, um, and he kind of shows, I guess, a good, uh, you know, he kind of just lays it out in a, in a great way on how uh, back then, even still, you had a class exploiting the people. Um, he even speaks about Martin Delaney um, looking to go to because uh, he was a part of essentially the petty bourgeois class. Um, for those who don't know, he's a black nationalist, a famous black nationalist. A lot of people quote as saying uh, Africa for the Africans. Um, so yeah, so he uh, he was known, I think he was trying to meet with like Europe and other uh, Western powers in a way to try to um, tie himself into those repair powers to get money um, for the petty bourgeois class and exploiting East, uh, Eastern Africa uh, in a way. So. <laughs> So yeah, so I think he, he kind of lays that out. He kind of shows how uh, there were black slave owners back then. Um, some, you know, looking at dialectically, there were some who did free um, Africans who were enslaved, but then you had, he said he he had uh, examples of certain areas, uh, one being in Louisiana, that was a big place where um, there were a lot of uh, black slave owners um, who owned slaves solely for the same purposes that white slave owners had them <laughs> for yeah. it too. Um, so it kind of goes into that whole narrative is that as long as you have capitalism, um, and you put a black face in there, it's always going to be exploitation. 
um, at the root of it. So I guess maybe we could ca- kind of talk about that um, as a lot of the uh, ingenuine discussions about Black capitalism and removing it from, you know, exploitation. How is it still realized, you know, even if when we do have Black capitalism? I think one way, one way it's realized is, uh, is, is that you have, is, is, I think in some ways it's a lack of understanding what capitalism is. I think that there's a lack of understanding that, that the that primary object of capitalism is to is to acquire profit to accumulate so that you can make money off of that money. So if you have a whole class of people who don't, or a group of people who don't, who are exploited in general, and then then a lucky few who are able to, uh, as, as our comrade Jamila, um, so we talked about is that even if you are, if you do have this, uh, this collective of wealth and then you, you then you build this class of, of people of Africans who okay they okay they have money they, they have they have wealth they're able to be able to go to Davos they're able to go to Bilderberg they're able to go to um, uh, maybe get a few of them go to the Bohemian Club or something like that uh, uh, and and you, you and they and you and you're chilling with all these these other like wealthy folks and but in the end, you still have a lot of these nations who are still neo colonized because they all, the whole, whole bulk of the nation is paying off debt to the IMF, or <laughs> and they use all this money. To, but it's not really for the wealth of the nations. You, you get all these people like Africa's rising, or, or we get all these, or you get like, or you get, or you read something Black Enterprise, you, you just see like, oh. Oh, this guy, man, he's a CEO. Oh, okay, oh. That, that, that's great. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, oh, um, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. He's like, oh yeah, this person's like, they're big fans of like Thomas Sowell. I'm mean, like, okay, yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, um, so you, you, you have so, you, so it's like a lack of dialectical thinking. You, you, you don't see the, the history of even even among like the. People who do manage to um, have businesses that they do fa- they face uh, discrimination as far as especially if in, within the core they face discrimination as far as getting loans, the ability to like, get favorable as on their loans, or if they have housing, if they have housing, then then they then the price of that isn't as high as it could be has. Because if it, oh the scary scary the scary Africans are here, then and the, the, the price goes down, and then so and then and then if you are able to get so a mostly African nation, you still it's still the idea that if you're talking about uh, the mines, the the field like the farmland, the factories, the servers, and so on, a lot of that's still in European control, or if you did or like you get a to, a few, maybe, maybe like the Creole or their African, and but it's like it's still you still not you still not talking about the, the whole means of production and distribute distribution. Hey, even even though we have uh, ideological differences with say the UNIA, at least they understood that you have to have full control over the entirety of the the, the entirety of of the distribution and production process that yeah yeah you at least have to think that way otherwise you just you're just playing their game and you're and right more or less you're going to come up snake eyes <laughs> yeah it's all about who holds the control hey Winfrey, i think you're you're on mute i don't know i can't hear you okay so like the only two ways to actually get money or wealth is to get it from other people with money or wealth or to create it yourself like uh, the only organization, well, you can make your own money, uh, but like that probably won't be legal and they'll probably arrest you for like counterfeit. But the only the only organizations that can legally create it is the government. So like that's how like banks and contractors who work for the government get their wealth. Uh, like that's why there's uh, like you can see like the head of a bank is like on the board of trustees or like on the cabinet of a government um 
they got to make the law. That's how they get their money. They change policy so that like uh, money goes through them uh, in whatever way or fashion. Um, so the only way for Black people as a collective to get money, uh, and at least that's newly created, is from having control of the government. But like the government, like again, a gov- the government doesn't want to relinquish power to African people. Like they have other priorities. Like if Africans were to gain and maintain their wealth, then they'd lose a low wage worker base or like a, a source of, of low costing materials. Uh, that's why they like colonize parts of Africa. Uh, that's why they like shift policies for Africans. Like they want people who are basically hungry, who are willing to do as much work as possible for as little uh, pay as possible. Um, so like even paying Africans in America for their labor took centuries and like wars and like, for, and they're still trying to reverse that progress. Like, uh, like I'm pretty sure like uh, in Arkansas, they still have slaves who work in the governor's mansion. Uh, like that was something that Clinton had wrote in her book uh, that like she used slave labor. So like the government isn't trying to pay people is trying to pay people as little as possible for the work they, that they do. Uh, so it's not likely the government will pay at least the masses of African people, uh, even what they're worth, let alone enough to gain wealth. Uh, like the other way to get it is from people who already have money. Uh, so like if you want to gain wealth, you would have to get that from wealthy people. Uh, but wealthy people gain their wealth from like uh, either the government or from like underpaying you for creating things and then overcharging you uh, for the things that you create. So like, that's something that like, perhaps individual people who are uh, individual people or communities can try to do, uh, but not tens of or hundreds of millions of people. Because like those tens or hundreds of millions of people are the people that they're underpaying and overcharging. So it's against their interests to give them enough money. Yeah, and to your point, I think of, um, I hate to name drop, but you know, you can think of someone like Roland Martin. I just watched a great black media uh, podcast about this. Uh, they were talking how you have agents for this class where they're basically just trying to get money from white people, you know, to fund their whole theory. That's the whole thing. It's like, we need you to pay us so that we can sell this message so that black people can feel they can participate in the system. They can, you know, engage and somehow make bank. Uh, and that kind of goes into the conversation right now we're having about cryptocurrency and just kind of like the thrill. And I remember that just really exciting the the news uh, maybe four years ago. Now I'm seeing people just really pressuring um, people to just invest in this cryptocurrency. Um, of course, not understanding the what that does to the environment, what that does to nature. It's a lot of energy it uses. It uses to mine, you know, these uh, bitcoins and stuff. So, I mean, just the connection, you know, there's just this thirst people have for getting money, but no one's understanding the exploitation aspect. Like you gotta connect it. Like money's just not gonna fall out in the air. It's like you mentioned, Winford, somebody gotta pay for it. And a lot of these people are not getting paid anything for that labor. So it just kind of, you know, opens up a, a whole new conversation for this thirst for money, this thirst to attain wealth. Where's it coming from? Why are we not connecting it to the reality of capitalism and the whole function which is to exploit and extract minerals for, you know, these private merchant interests. And as we're tied together, uh, your point on cryptocurrency and my first point about the other relation between the, the connections of people with wealth is that, in fact, like some of the main people who are making a, a, lot, of, a lot of the dough from a cryptocurrency or, or where are you wealthy? <laughs> so, <laughs> you have to get early in order to really make money in cryptocurrency. You have to be one of the first investors. Most people get in too late and they spend more than they're getting back. I mean, there's like, yeah, laws written to protect these <laughs> these interests. And 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 not, not to mention, is we talk about that not not only that, but a, and it's, it is like something that happened before, like well before we even had a cryptocurrency that. If there are a number of people who are wealthy and able to maintain their wealth, they they are not they not exactly above the table. They're um, like some of them some of their wealth they got some of their wealth because they know 
they use this when we first talk about they, they know people they know people in the government or they are the government so uh, or you think about the uh, like the, the mass amount of money that the CIA the co- the cocaine international uh, administration um, they're able to uh, they're able to deal so you know if you heard about Air America this week basically the it's like transporting like, all the uh, uh, narcotics from the call the Golden Triangle, it's like Vietnam, Cambodia, Lao, that very much money there, or, or or right now in Afghanistan or Colombia, the money made from through that, or or, or even like like the recent uh, like boom in like legal marijuana that a lot of a lot of people, a lot of the wealthy people, people making wealth from that. They don't, they don't, they, a lot of them don't look like us. <laughs> so <laughs> they're, they're not African. So, so again, I don't understand that this like, this wondrous view of capitalism as some sort of pleasant, some sort of pleasant, like, oh, it's a free market. Oh, it's perfect, perfect for information. It's so, all it's all great. But uh, you know what? Uh, let, let me just let me just take your let me just take your land and like pay all of you for a quarter and I get like right. twenty dollars profit. So. <laughs> like the last time that like at least Africa wasn't exploited for the wealth of non Africans and the really the last millennia was the Middle Ages and for the Middle Ages Europe was suffering like it was in shambles and then it was after they they started exploiting Africa that they gained their wealth back. And like even before that was really like the Roman Empire. Uh, And they gained a lot of their wealth and like literal bread and wheat from Carthage, so from Africa. Land, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Land, because land gives you that power to decide who gets to be fed, who gets to have a home. All of that connects to the land. And I mean, it seems so easy that that would be the case, but there's so much propaganda that people just have this thirst for money. Like they just want to get money as opposed to understanding that they need to own the land. If you're African, you know, we're, we're fighting for our land because neo-colonials and all of these forces are taking that, they're extracting that. They're, and, and that's what this fight is. And, you know, this material thirst, you know, having, you know, we talk about the pursuit of happiness, like everyone should have the right to, you know, have enough money to get the bag. But if that is not connected to what's happening with those resources, then you're fa- you're gonna just it's fallacious. You know, you're 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 actively justifying the continual oppression if you don't connect it. I mean, and I know that happens because the propaganda is so rich. And when you really understand just how far this goes, it's like, yeah, well, this is the cost. You know, it's, it's something we all have to be responsible for. We have to actively fight against this because this is how this is why they're fed this is why they're fat with all of this wealth because they're continually stealing it and they're justifying that by saying that you can do the same thing you know if you you know it's like it doesn't matter if you you know a black you know we talked about this this earlier in our uh work study process even if it's an unambiguous african who's continuing on with an interest to just exploit the people don't matter if you look like me or if you don't look like me if your interest is not in the masses of the people then that's where that struggle will be waged because it has to be about the masses of people. I don't care if you look like me, if you have your family, that doesn't, that shouldn't, you know, we're more principled than that. At least we should strive to be. And, 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 and go, another point as far as cryptocurrency is that, that even if you, even if you're people who do make wealth, you still, you still need, okay, yeah, you make cryptocurrency, but how, how's the, how are you going to get the, Material to make the chips, to make the motherboards, to make so and so. Like, do you? Uh, do you? Do you? Are you on the board? Tri- are you on the board of directors in uh, Intel or of uh, Foxconn? Uh, are, do you? Are you Oppenheimer? Are you? Do you know Paul Kagame by any chance? Uh, or you know, uh, Museveni? You? Are you getting that? Do you know that? Um, that cool. That cool lady in um. Uh, Gene Anyans in uh, Bolivia to help help fund make those Teslas or do you know Angela Merkel? <laughs> you know, like you gotta think. They think, think you gotta think a lot more like uh, broadly about how like who's like who's in charge of like all these parts of the of the economy because 
because you still you still need to have control of the machinery and it, unless you have a major server farm you, you, that you just uh, renting out then uh yeah kind of kept out of luck so yeah. and this rise in the at least the price of crypto is like pretty similar to the like insane rise of uh like in the insane rise of prices and like a uh, computer in the computer industry and the software engineering industry and in like the 90s. And so people are at least then people are saying, oh, yeah, all you need to do is invest like so and so amount of money into like this company or like ETF. And then like 20 years from now, you'll be a millionaire. Right. <laughs> like what ended up happening in like I think like 2000, 2003 like 90% of like that wealth just disappeared. The people who owned those companies left with millions of dollars. But then the people who like were just investing and putting money into those companies, like they lost basically most of the wealth they put in. So like if you put your money into something that you don't actually control, then other people control it for you. I was just about to say that, man. Like we don't dictate the market. You don't as much as you want to say it's a tool for liberation, man. It's like, man, we don't control the market. If you know the ones who do dictate it, if it crashes tomorrow, you're gonna lose all your money. While the ones who are wealthy, they're gonna walk away. It's got for real. Yeah, We've seen that happen with the GameStop thing and all that too. So yeah, you remember Pets.com? Remember all those ads with the little like, cute like uh, stock puppet dog like and. The, what what now it's now it's mean so yeah <laughs> yeah I mean exactly it just seems so clear that these are attempts to just distract us and it's unfortunately again working because they've just gone a they've gone on overdrive with this message and I'm just talking to a lot of folks that really believe um, going back to the petty bourgeois class you know they look at these entertainers that tell them that they can participate you know you can you can climb up you can gain this access. But the um, disconnection to exploitation is just so vast and that has to be bridged. Like people have to you know, once again, that's why we encourage everyone to join an organization and develop a political education to understand just why this is happening and why they are using people of color um, and anyone else who would be an agent for their interests. Because unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of that tokenism adage it works for a lot of folks because it's like, oh, we see, you know, we talked about that earlier. You see someone who's inhabiting a space of quote unquote power, but if they're doing that power to will uh, violence, then that shouldn't be okay. That shouldn't, we shouldn't just accept that. We should hold uh, all of these aspects accountable. Um, and I think a lot of that is just missed when we focus, we, you know, this that reactionary aspect of just like being happy to see ourselves, not understanding just kind of how this all works. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think, too, just to make clear for anybody who's watching this, I think uh, for those who don't really understand where the point we're coming from, or maybe like a reaction, like, oh, these people are telling me not to go live in a house. And uh, it's like, that's not where our position is. It's just we're trying to say have a have a, a real analysis on capitalism instead of trying to, uh, you know, tout these uh, fallacies or these uh idealist thoughts of how capitalism works and not real material analysis on it. Um, you know, this doesn't mean that, you know, I have a car, I, I'm doing this for my house. So, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not living in like some abstract reality or, or like, in a, you know, outside somewhere where uh, I feel like, Oh yeah, because you know, the capitalist system is it's like, that's the dialectical understanding of it is that, you know, we live in a, in a capitalist society, so we have to survive. We still have to go, go do everything as everyday working people. Um, what we're saying is, is that we need alternatives. Um, and alternative enough for us is that we say it's a scientific socialism. Um, and that's what we're looking to accomplish, uh, you know, on the continent of Africa, because, uh, you know, that's where our basis is. That's where our power is, um, is to tie into our continent, our homeland. Because uh, once you know, once Africa is unified and socialist, then, you know, Africans everywhere will be free and powerful. So that, that's our basis of it. I just wanted to make that clear for <laughs> For anyone, um, I guess maybe we could speak about uh, the alternative socialism and why do we see it as, uh, you know, a better alternative than, than capitalism and um, how will we achieve a socialist society? Like what we need to be done? Uh, 
Uh, all the uh, main thing is like we talked about with a uh, 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 cryptocurrency and the environment, environmental cost with it is that there it that that if you change the ideal if you change the system from ex, like exchange value which, in which the, the whole point of the system is to get uh, whatever you think is worth and and that regardless of whether it's a necessity or not that the all important key is you get value for for making an exchange like one key difference is that socialism it, is dependent upon use value that is dependent on what use it has for people and at a baby say oh well it, it didn't work and so if you oh it didn't work you blah 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 like yeah like for one like, uh, you, you you miss for one like stop stop believing all that fbi crap like uh stop like like read something else um like actually read like what like the material from um from there yeah, yeah like everything wasn't perfect but you know what no, nothing is like do do you think do you think the people in Peru like like lecture side do you think the people in Peru like like over, super overjoyed with uh Fujimoriism? Right. No. <laughs> do you think the um, do you think people in Bangladesh Bangladesh going to those like factories or those sweatshops, uh, do you think they're overjoyed or do you think like maybe maybe they want something different? So uh yeah, right. <laughs> so um <laughs> And it, even within the even within the core, you st you still you still see some uh, you see like privatization, like deregulation, the fi financially. Like we talked about debt early, like like more like more and more spending is like oh I'm spending money I don't I don't have I never will have so uh, so, you, so so that's another thing is that we want a system where people are able to hear for each other. And as opposed to individual like, profit for themselves, that's yes, because like if, if anybody, any of you think, well, yeah, well, don't you want people like, 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 like right now, don't you want people to, who are like curing, like giving vaccine for COVID to, uh, you know, don't you want that to be rewarded? Like, like you want, like, yeah, you want those like 10 people who are like becoming billionaires, you, you want, um. While like people are still locked down, still like, like getting getting half their half their pay, getting furloughed, getting like not, not able to escape like terrible relations because they're locked down, like increase in violence, interpersonal violence, not able to participate in like formal economy and all sorts. Like do you do, do you have do you think you have to think dialectically about this that uh, social site? Is and it's better for people like to under, like to reduce that alienation people have on the capitalism because it's like it because you you have all this comm commodification of everything of of how you look like the stuff you say it, that a lot that a lot of that just is taxing like a lot of the and we, we will, we'll have another episode about uh the link between capitalism and mental health but and and disability generally but like a lot like a lot of like a lot of the, the tension that people are having, a lot of anxiety has come from that all uh, drive to, I gotta make the next bucks or else I won't have my house or my apartment. I gotta do it or else I won't eat. I gotta do it or else I won't get some medic medical attention. I won't be, or I won't be able to get get this degree or something that it, I can go on, but <laughs> just no, that's, that's why we're here. here. <laughs> You're absolutely right about that. It, it, I know we're going to talk about that in another podcast, but yeah, it can be very exhausting because it's a perpetual, constant thing, and that's why we have to do our best to ideologically, you know, mentally also just uplift ourselves and educate ourselves, and to be light, um, giving ourselves understanding for these factors. Because yeah, it's it, it's a lot, and then when you got all of the media pundits speaking at you and your friends and your family, you know, it's just, it can be a lot to just swim through, but the work has been done. I mean, we, we're going to put the links in the description of the books that can be read. And again, hopefully you can join an organization and be involved in the process to better catch the ways, um, you know, these things are perpetually given out. I mean, cause it's, it's a thing. 
I like don't have a complete understanding of what an alternative would look like in terms of day-to-day -day practice, but at least in terms of like uh, agrarian societies, the basis was always land and the ability to like what to basically grow and create all the resources that you need to rely on in order to live. Uh, so whether that's like a farmer or people who make clothes or people who make uh, like houses, uh, finding a way to make that locally in our own communities. Uh, from And then from there, like once you have all the necessities that you need, uh, there will like likely be a surplus and from that surplus be able to help others, like help the people who can't necessarily create things uh, and help create like more, basically more resources. Yeah, I will say, um, you know, one alternative side I'm saying is, is, is socialism and, you know, understanding that who owns and controls the means of production uh, and who owns and controls the wealth. You know, instead of a capitalist society where only a few own and control that wealth and the means of production, um, you know, the, the socialism would be the, the exact opposite where uh, the people who own and control that, uh, you know, kind of where everything, where everyone else is saying in regards to, have making sure everybody's needs are met, the state would ensure uh, that everyone's, um, you know, needs are met to the full capacity of basic needs, uh, you know, food, clothing, shelter, so on and so on. Things will be, uh, you know, things won't be privatized as well. Um, things will be done uh, for the public. Um, and once again, they will have ownership of that too. So, and the only way that could be realized or, you know, done is through organized efforts, um, you know, through, uh, you know, the masses of the people uh, struggling and you know this is going to get to a point too it's going to get to uh you know uh maybe guerrilla warfare and I maybe it's probably going to get to that point at some point but you know the first step would be um having the people organized engaging in ideological struggle um you know building community and institutions for power uh as well so uh you know and I think even the same dialectically it's not going to you know, straight to armed struggle, but uh, and everyone won't be taking up arms because you're still going to need people who provide medical care and other things as well. But um, you know, you're still going to need maybe even civil disturbances and boycotts and things is is, is a leverage too. Uh, but you still can't avoid the armed struggle aspect as well. Um, but you know, we can see examples. You know, that we've probably mentioned before, like in Cuba, China, uh, where they wage revolutions, and you know, the people are in socialist societies or they are transitioning into a social society as well. Um, you know, and, uh, and just being honest too, I think we talked about this on our last work study in regards to like, um, those governments or the socialist governments still needing, uh, you know, uh, especially your places where infrastructure isn't as strong, um, still needing foreign capital to help build those places. So I think I understand that dialectically is like, you're still going to need money to, to build those things. So once again, you know, people like to, um, you know, go from like, you know, super like crazy tangents and say like nonsensical things and be like, well, you guys are saying you don't need this. Like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> we're dialectical materialists. Like, we're dealing with the material reality of things. We're not coming from, you know, this comes from rigorous study um, and understanding of the material conditions of people. So, you know, we're not advocating for no nonsense or stuff, some idealist society or utopia. So, uh, so yeah. Um, yeah, that's a uh, well, go ahead. Uh, there's also this assumption that, like, oh, that most people are lazy and don't like doing work. Uh, that is like really used to feel okay. Now we have to like underpay people and force people to basically risk their lives, uh, if they choose not to work like 60 70 hours a week, uh, in order to survive. Uh, but at least when you look at it, like in the past, people were like working and today people still work even when they have the money to uh, and like are still and people enjoy like uh, helping people, volunteering, uh, like gardening, uh, making clothes, like all the things that we need in society, people like doing. Uh, so to say that like if we don't have a system in which people are struggling to survive uh, and the only way to like prevent yourself from struggling is uh, 
work long hours would be a fallacy. Right. And I go, I go along with the point about, about working uh, long hours that a lot of capitalism, a lot of capitalism right now is relying upon work that that just does that according to capitalism is not productive. So, so it's so it's at, so it's pretty asinine to talk about like the 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 lack of attention, the lack of uh, effort. Like, oh, you, you, you dang socialist, you just want to sit on your butt and uh, yeah. get get the wealth. Like, aside from like 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 uh, do you, like you know you know um you know that um you know that uh, maid you have you know, and you have she's who's from Dominica, like do you, like. Like, like, are you paying? Are you paying her like what she's worth, or are you just, or are you just glad that you have, you have someone else to, like, let you have uh, while you get, while you like, talking nonsense to your, to your buddy like Carl and Chad or something, and um, at you uh, know, in marketing, like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's and, like a lot, like, a lot of the work is like a lot of, it, it, even like, like for book where. where Trying to get re- go through a uh, uh, patriarchy accumulation on a world scale, like a lot, like, a, like it underscores that a lot of the work is, like, a lot of the work is just not counted in capitalism. It wants it is like this duality that it wants to be, that if it's not in a factory, it's not in office, and it's not in somewhere else that is that doesn't count. But oh, uh, well, if you're if you have if you birth someone birthed us, we someone birthed the workers, someone. Clean, clean the, cleaned out the, cleaning your apartment or take, getting the, getting your tomatoes or you get or they're, uh, working the mine or working on some up. They, they, a lot, a lot of it's not, like it's not, even thought of. But it's so reliant on it that you, you, you honestly think that this is this is something that, but well, no one else wants to do it. But okay, but even even then you, even then like. Right, more and more people, even in like, um, in like the like Western side, a lot more of their work is temper becoming more temporary. It's becoming, uh, um, you get this flexibility, but it means oh, you don't get any benefits. You don't get any. Uh, you got pay for it. You got pay for your own. Oh, now, well, now with like more people working on online, then the 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 rent that you're paying is also to to pay for your office to pay for. <laughs> so, so. You, so is this so basically a third quote third worldization of work, and it's com- it's coming for you, Papa. So you, you so you, you can't just think you can't just think it's just gonna uh, stay and you can't you can't think it's just gonna stay in uh, in India or, or it's gonna stay in uh, Ethiopia or stay in uh, Belarus or something. It's just gonna it's coming for you. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's it's crazy. A lot of a lot of uh, you know ideological confusions out there in regards to capitalism and you know it being a basis for liberation. And no one really want to liberate us at all. It's just gonna switch the guard of uh, you know the white the European settlers having an own control of the means of production to black ones doing it in regards to black capitalism. So yeah, it is. As that, I guess that encompasses the whole episode right there. <laughs> in, in one sentence, yeah. Yeah, I think it's also a question of like, what is the production for? Like, what's the purpose of the production? So like, uh, let's say if I'm like, a, I'm a grad student or a law student and like, I wanna do pro bono work uh, to help like, let's say immigrant families or if I just came out of med school and I want to like help black, well, if I want to help communities that don't necessarily have money, uh, if, I've, if I'm in debt because of like uh, law schools or uh, medical schools that are like flagrantly overcharging for the work that they do, then now I'm in debt. So I can't do the work that I would want to do for free. And instead, have, I'd have to do work for like a big organization uh, that isn't necessary. Like their goal isn't to help people. Like the goal is to just increase shareholder value. 
So if our production is like more oriented towards ensuring that everybody has the has the standards that they need to survive. So like food, shelter, uh, like clothes, and like just the necessities of like if that was our goal, uh, then we'd have a better society. But at least in the society we have right now, like the goal is just to, at least for companies and like large organizations, is to increase shareholder value, which can oftentimes come in conflict with uh, like ensuring that people have what they need. Yeah, I would argue it comes in conflict just by nature because it's like exploitation. You know, these systems rely on the uh, active exploitation to keep, I mean, if it's all about profit, then that means your health, your mind, your house, all of that don't matter. It's as long as that profit can be extracted. And that's why socialism is that better alternative because we understand with socialism, everyone's needs are met and it's not privatized. It's not like one a select group of people owning it all. It's everyone being involved in that process and participating to create that better world. Let me let me put something to everyone. Oh, let's uh, let's say let's say I'm I'm watching this and it's like first time. I'm like, oh, okay, you guys have a point, but uh, right, I can't I can't get the, I can't get to Cuba right now because um, you know, yes, but um. I can't get can't make socials right right like do do I just not do I not just not shop uh, do I not just buy black uh, do I not just support a African cooperative like what what what, what what you want me do you want me just not do anything like that or like let's just say your thoughts or or like, or you think about oh I heard about Acon wants to create the city like I can't I can't like isn't that isn't that a can can that work? Uh, so let's uh, yeah, I think it helps individuals, but not hundreds of millions of people. And the masses is hundreds of millions of people. Yeah, that that whole that whole Acon thing is a sham. Um, because really, like you know, just reading the stuff about it, and um, it's really set up to create like this fake notion of like a Wakanda, or whatever. But it's really for the elites. <laughs> right. Yeah, like they're, they're the only ones. It's probably going to be for settlers and elites, uh, petty bourgeois. So it's like they're going to be the only ones to be able to afford it. Like the working and poor class people aren't, you know, there there's no, there's, haven't been anything to say that those, those houses are going to be affordable um, or anything in those cities are going to be affordable for working and poor class Africans who <laughs> occupy that area. So um, that's one. And that goes into capitalism. It's like that's just, you know. The premise of it is like you know they they it's kind of like Kagame like um you know uh with you um what's the play with Rwanda you know he's the president of Rwanda and it's like you know he's building the infrastructure in the main city but he's leaving all the other places you know the villages and the surrounding areas is destitute you know so just so the NBA can go there and profit off <laughs> yeah. doing games there and stuff like that um you know that's why they picking him up even though he's a he's a mass murderer he has blood on his hands too as well um. You know they they uh they don't speak about that um and how he facilitates like extracting the mineral uh resources out of the uh the congo too uh for his personal gain and the gain for the ruling class um but that's an episode for another day <laughs> um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh but yeah that that's just the whole fallacy and and then the, even the notion of oh i can't make the coup but well you know i think it's it's every right and duty for you to the struggle to see that reality. Obviously, you, you may not see it in your in your lifetime, but later foundation because you know there's going to be uh, a generation after you who's going to live, and obviously, you know you're you're trying to advance humanity. So that's what we're trying to do: is advance humanity and advance um, advance the world. And then obviously, if you the way you can do it is to join an organization and build a coalition with Cuba and with Cuban organizations and with um, other socialist and progressive organizations fighting for justice. You know, so. Um, you know, you have to link that too as well uh, to fight the imperialist powers because the systems that we fight is not localized. Like imperialism isn't just happening in Africa. Imperialism is just happening in Central and South America. It's happening in all those places, happening in the entire global South, you know, um, as well. So, and then, you know, even with the notion of um, what you was talking about earlier, like, oh, yeah, socialism failed. It's like, you know, people speak about that, but don't speak about the fact that, uh, you know, the Western powers purposely went to overthrow a lot of socialist governments. 
Um, you know, they, they, they throw a lot of propaganda about these socialist governments too as well. Um, but people like to, you know, not look at the coups that happen, um, you know, the different uh, infiltrations that happen from the Western powers and things of that nature. So um, assassinations as well. So, you know, they, they, <laughs> they purposely do that out just so they can tell you, oh, you failed on his own goodwill. Um, you know, it's like, do you talk about, yeah, you know, Krumah tried in Ghana, but it failed. But it's like, he didn't get to see the full term presidency because a coup happened. This was backed by the CIA. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure a lot, it would have been a lot more advanced in Ghana than it is now if, um, you know, his government was realized uh, to this full capacity. So, um, so, yeah. Or just allowed to function on its own without intervention. Right. Exactly. And, not to, and not to mention, like, it's not like capitalism itself, like, it didn't just happen like that. It, it took time for it to develop the way it did. So, it, you it, just, you know, that was going to be my point. Like, we got to understand that dialectical aspect that it takes time. Like, this is a protracted struggle. Capitalism just didn't, you know, jump out of nowhere. There was the Berlin conferences, there were laws done, there were, you know, meetings situated to ensure this was actively done. And so, why we enslavement of Africans and his minerals? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. No, exactly. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> no, but yeah, so I just think we got to look at that. We can't think that, I mean, this just happens out of nowhere. It takes time. And that's why we just encouraging y'all, you know, who are not involved in the organization to just join and let's help us, you know, continue this fight because the, the, the work is going to continue regardless. But since we're building a mass movement, you know, we need more and more people and it's one thing, you know, even though a lot of us may not even make it to Africa, we look at Marcus Garvey, he never even made it to Africa, but his heart was still clear in the knowledge that Africa should be for the Africans and we should all have means of our production so that we get these outside forces out and we create. And, and, and if you just connect it just to technology, like all of it is really just mind blowing. Um, but I think that missing link there, or the reason why a lot of folks can't catch it is because you got, you know, you got the petty bourgeois class, you got all of these forces uh, presenting these options for us, but um, we gotta be dialectical. We can't just be on our individual basis. We gotta international, internationalize um, struggle, as you mentioned, uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, and uh, something that we touched, talked about earlier is in regards to the uh, massacre and Tulsa, like the 100 anniversary of the Tulsa massacre is, oh, I, how do you think, a what? Molly, how do you think it's being used as a as a propaganda tool, and why do you think it's done right now? And what, what other things do you think is about uh, is spoken about the post that that people even if we say, oh, it's we finally got redemption that people know about it, but what? But aren't there some things miss? Are there some things missing from this too? Yeah, I think uh, with Tulsa, it's just, you know, people, it's just the same thing that Nixon has is propagated as, as a means to derail a revolutionary movements or just revolutionary uh, thoughts or consciousness um, in general, uh, to have people thinking that there's, um, you know, there's a way that we could gain liberation through this sadistic, twisted system <laughs> that we're operating under, um, even though there is no way to do so. Uh, you know, as well, because, you know, one, we, we don't own a means of production. Uh, even the petty bourgeois uh, don't own a means of production. They're just the, the in-between person between a working uh, class and the ruling class. They're just there to get a piece of crumbs from the work, from the ruling class. So, um, yeah, and the whole notion in regards to Tulsa is being that, uh, you know, once again, Wakanda, like, <laughs> they have to create that fallacy. Like, you guys had all these businesses, and yes, you know, we did have businesses, but the over, uh, overwhelming majority of those people were um, working, you were working class people. <laughs> it's like any other society, like everywhere you go. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, like, did you think like, you know, it was Dubai? I don't know, like, what, what, what you, <laughs> I don't know what you guys thought uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma was, but um, there's a great uh, session and uh, study that was revealed um, from the uh, breaking or breaking myths or something like that from the Black Power Media. It's a great session. It's a two-part episode. They, they kind of go and dive into um, a lot of the statistics in regards to it. Um, and even then, when you see what happened with that, it's like, uh, you know, you had urban renewal, which is something I read about um, when, when I first learned about the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre. It's like, 
probably like some time last year, is that even uh, after the massacre happened, um, and then even other various cities that had like all these businesses and black wealth, um, you know, they built highways to it. So it kind of goes to show we don't control the policy, we don't control the means of production. So we have to deal with politics. We have to deal with like that's seeky first the political kingdom and everything else will be added into it, you know, just like Kwame Nkrumah said. So we have to seek politics first and be unified politically before anything else can change, you know. All these other things, you know, yes, I'm not trying to say we can't build institutions and build community, um, you know, we're struggling through organizations, but, you know, we have to, uh, within those organizations, the the objective has to be changing the politics and the economy that we live under, um, because without changing the politics, nothing else will fall in line. And um, another point is, uh, is that is, is that one of the, one of the main like, African groups that that did that did like, protection during during the Tulsa was the African Blood Brotherhood, who who believe it or not were a African communist group. <laughs> <laughs> communist? What? That's a uh, dirty word. Don't say that on here. <laughs> <laughs> but YouTube, 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 the YouTube gremlins are gonna come for me. <laughs> it's the devil of the capitalist religion. Always will be. They understand. <laughs> they know why. And apparently, and that's another reason they like, didn't get talk about. Not only, not only the fact that like the many Africans were murdered, but also the fact that it didn't get worse, or or like the Europeans who got. Marked themselves by like, who, right in, who are in the African Blood Brotherhood or other like African, like militias. So, and that's another point that you probably don't hear much about. So, so, so again, like you, like people like think like again, like something like the Black Panther Party gets a lot of again a lot of, like I recently, but again, like one an earlier group was Black the African Blood Brotherhood who had that combination of the Black Nationalist and like the uh, communist um, philosophy that that's not that's not talked about much either. So and that's another, that's another thing that like they they want you to like take like yourself, but the cap the black capitalist uh, of propaganda soup. But again, you don't hear you don't hear the fact that it wasn't just it wasn't just like and it, like just. Africans just getting murked and they're, they're sent to like concentration. Like that did happen. Like let's we're not like minimizing like what what happened to the uh, to the ancestors there. But is like there is there was resistance to it too that that you don't hear much about. And and that's not even getting to like the whole uh, like hullabaloo about oh like reparation like reparations and people who suddenly don't care they never really heard about revolution suddenly caring about it now and like uh, there's a lot there's a lot like even when uh, like stuff uh, about our history does get like stuff hidden stuff about history does get mainstream attention you still have to be careful about what is being done to it and get that education so that you know that they're trying to do it for a purpose other than your liberation that's all i can say so yeah yeah and i think uh I guess one of the last things I'll say is even with uh, under this capitalist society, you've seen it change, you know, from over the past few generations where it was, um, you know, what Robin L. Allen talks about in Black Awakening um, in capitalist America. Uh, you know, it was domestic colonialism at first. Um, and now we're kind of seeing uh, <clears throat> like domestic neocolonialism, uh, you know, with this, uh, you know, all this propping up with black celebrities and petty bourgeois class and stuff like that. Um, you know, and he talks about how the Ford Foundation, you know, pretty much uh, derailed and co-opted a lot of the movements that we had, the Black Power Movement. So they started funding a lot of movements purposely to go in and control it, <laughs> um, you know, for that, for that, for that main purpose. So, um, you know, and then that's another problem with, you know, uh, believing in Black capitalism in a sense, because, you know, given that we don't own the means of production, we don't own, dictate the capital that's being dished out to certain things, um, you know, those who do can have it serve its purpose. Uh, same thing with goes to like even HBCUs, you know, as great as they are in, in the sense of like, <laughs> in the sense of, you know, it's, it's all Africans in, it, in a way, I guess, in some ways, you know, dialectic and say, okay, that's good here around your own people. But at the same time, um, you know, those institutions are only controlled by, 
by us. You know, they're they're looking for funding for which is the same thing with the, with the whole buying power thing. The whole purpose of that whole report is to attain uh, white uh, revenue as you know from the rule. They want to make up this fallacy that we have all this disposable income, so they could uh, present it to uh, the ones who have the the capital and say, "Hey, look how much." buying power black people have so advertise to them so we can get a piece of the <laughs> piece of the pie so you know that that just goes to show that you know it, it's not when you really have a full analysis on it and you you do the studying and understanding how capitalism works you you know everything we laid out here just kind of shows the inefficiency of it and the gap so um yeah i mean that's my story and i'm sticking to it so uh, <laughs> i don't know if there's, <laughs> yeah. if there's anything else okay. anywhere else to add like uh i guess if you so if you go to detroit like there's a museum of african-american history uh and like i guess it's funded partly by ford so like if you you can see like things from like uh the inception of humanity up till now and like there's not really any mention of like class disputes or like attempts to gain wealth or like things of that nature so like if the people like if if an organization has a goal of like basically increasing its own wealth or like its own shareholder value uh, and like they're funding you, it means that they're funding you to continue to increase their own wealth, uh, whether that's like uh, making sure that you don't include some parts of your own history uh, to show you that like, hey, like. Africans were like fighting in like slave revolts or were fighting for better wages or were fighting to maintain their land. Um, if the people, if the institutions that are creating the content or the history uh, that you know of as your own history has it out against you, uh, then they'll do whatever they can. So we can't really rely on institutions whose goal is to exploit us. And do they do they mention uh, one place where Henry Ford got an award? I, I, was this place uh, <laughs> they used to they they had armbands and spoken Deutsch? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, my yeah, Nazi too. Germany, Nazi yeah. Germany. Oh. <laughs> yeah, they didn't mention about. that at all. Yeah. They actually said that like Ford was a savior to black people. Uh, interestingly enough, like at the museum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Oh my god, that was a funny thing. They will do all of that to make people you know justify the continuance of those dominations, but that's just nonsense. Oh man. Yeah, if it weren't if it weren't for me. I want like I want to pay you so much that we that we pay you so little that you fi you finally had to get unionized and get finally get those middle class jobs that will eventually bring over down to the south or China or some place that we that doesn't have like better unions. So Ford saved you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that's a like actually a big problem with like nonprofits and philanthropy. Like a lot of the time, the organizations have a good idea of like what will help people, uh, but the people that they're looking for funding from, like they have their own ideas of what should happen with the organizations. Right. So if you don't have any cap, I think like Kwame Nkrumah said this about Guinea, like. Uh, I think it's like Guinea doesn't need capitalism. It just needs capital. Uh, but the only way to gain that capital is from people who have that, who have their own interests. Right. Yeah. I, mean, I love that line capitalist system. Yeah. I love that line for a second too, right? I, I quote it all the time. <laughs> so yeah, man, I mean, is there any last words? I mean, I know we said a lot in this episode, but is there anything else, uh, parting words you guys have? If you want, if you want to buy from, from African business or some someone you see on Etsy or someone you know down on 125th or down or the South Side or something, like go ahead. Like we're not saying don't do it. Just that that in itself is not going to liberate 
as long as Africa is not, is under foreign control or under the control of a few uh, neocolonial puppets, that it's not going to matter. That you still got to organize to make sure that land is free. Yes. Mm-hmm. And also, the thing people do like, well, black people do like, most black people do like buying black. Uh, they just ha- don't have money. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's like I was buying money. Putting money into your t shirt company. Yeah. And it's so funny, like I was saying earlier, like people would say, oh, yeah, like, we're so poor and disenfranchised. And look at the so buy black. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the kind yeah. of picture there? I hear that all the time. Yeah. But I mean, like, like Hollywood, like everyone's saying too is like, hey, like I, I support, you know, a black business, but um, it's, that shouldn't be the basis of our liberation. Is solely, oh yeah, if we just, you know, reinvest our money, you, even though we don't have any money to reinvest, <laughs> to reinvest it, right. um, or disposable income to do so. Uh, you know, that's not going to liberate us. Like, you know, I know what you hear about revolution is just solely just like bloodthirst and craziness, madness and all that. Um, but you, you have to really understand that the revolution is science, a scientific uh, method. Um, it's not just going to happen. We're not just going to wake up one day and just randomly pick up a gun. Um, can't remember what the quote was by, but it's like, uh, what is what is what's the saying? Um, it's a Sankara. Yeah, it's a Sankara quote. It's a... Uh, in regards to picking up a gun with our ideological training, it's essentially is like a it's a potential terrorist terrorist. Yes. Um, so it's like you need the ideological process, you need to um, you know, there's actions that lead up into that. So so yeah, um that those are my last words, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, basically you can't oh I feel like I'm just continuing the conversation, but like <laughs> you can't cool. get well. <laughs> You can't gain wealth from like people who are struggling to pay rent unless you steal it. And if you're stealing it, then it isn't wealth for them either. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, so before we go, uh, we just want to big up some of our other podcasts. We definitely recommend y'all to go check them out as well. Um, one of them being uh, with our comrade Ajama, who's been featured on one of our episodes. Go watch that episode too. And his daughter, his lovely daughter, Shakira. Uh, every Sunday they have a session. Um, I believe it's on Facebook and YouTube, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And then we also have our wonderful New Mexico chapter. Every Thursday they host their podcast as well, um, or their session. I believe they're they're doing theirs on, um, on Twitter. They live stream it. And I believe theirs appears on the main page on our AAPRP International page uh, on YouTube as well. Um, and then we also have a Revolutionary African Women's Podcast um, from our comrade in Missouri and Halamatu. And then lastly, I believe we have the uh, Forward Ever Podcast with our comrades as well over, uh, I believe, over on the West Coast. Um, I believe theirs should be on um, the various uh, streaming sites uh, for for. Various, but I can't think of the name of them right now. I'm we'll have the link. Guys. Yeah, we'll put the link somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely support them. Check them out. Um, you know, we once again we implore everyone to join the organization. And I will say this before I uh, end this. Um, you know, when, when we say join the organization, I think some people have some. Oh, he's just telling me to join, and you know, people. I don't have to do anything with the community. It's like no, we have to do stuff with the community. <laughs> That's what it tells to join the organization. You have to engage in ideological struggle and stuff like that. Like. You know, the organization, we're not just saying it because it sounds cool or we want to romanticize. Like, once again, there's nothing that, uh, there's nothing that can be done to alter uh, society or change society if we don't, um, you know, do the change ourselves to organize efforts. So that's why we say join organization because, uh, you know, it's, it's scientific, scientifically proven that once, you know, the masses of the people could, could change society. So the only way we could do that is in an organized way and not a spontaneous um uh, you know, just mobilize with without organized efforts. So, um, so yeah, so I guess with that, join the organization. Uh, we appreciate you guys for listening in and we look forward to catching you on the next episode next Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern. And with that being said, for whatever y'all. Forward. Forward. Forward.